Okay, so we're starting the recording. We are now moving to block number two, different operating envelopes. And uh, the idea here is uh, really to sort of connect with what I was mentioning in the first block uh, with the fact that yes, there's ideal calculation uh, as in the most accurate possible, which is capturing the physics, which is of course using electrical models and all the data that you have from all the corresponding customers in that particular uh, electrical circuit, right? The reality is that that is not gonna happen, okay? That's, we need to be very, very upfront with this. One thing is to understand what is the ideal situation. Another thing is to understand what can actually be done. Why? Uh, let's start with electrical models. It's extremely demanding uh, from the experience that we had with Bregage to really validate them. Because the validation requires data as well. Data that again, uh, means that you have all the smart meter data from you know, the corresponding customers. And the validation requires well transformed monitoring that is not very common at all anywhere in the world, right? So this, you have these two challenges already, you know, even for the validation of the electrical models, you need data, a lot of smart meter data, and you need, you know, sometimes transform and monitoring. So if you don't have, then how can you validate electrical models? Which means electrical models are very challenging to validate. So what can we do then if, if it is so difficult? Well, that is particularly what this uh, presentation is going to give you. It's, uh, uh, it's, these are the results uh, from a project funded by uh, CSIRO and the uh, Global Power System Transformation. And uh, there are two aspects to this project or two parts, uh, one that finished last year and then one that is ongoing. And we will share some of the findings with you. Uh, Arthur, can we actually move to the next slide, please? Thank you. So uh, the outline for this particular blog, first, we're going to discuss this uh, availability of infrastructure and data across Australia. So this is a survey that we did in 2022, and we're going to share relatively quick, just to give you an understanding. You know, I mean, as much as we're saying yes, uh, in Project Edge, Osnet Services was lucky enough to have and to put, you know, transformer monitoring. We did a validation of the electrical models because we had all this smart meter data. Yes, it's brilliant what was done and what was demonstrated, but that is not at all practical for most distribution companies, not just in Australia, but around the world, right? So for instance, you know, uh, use of smart meter data in Europe is extremely complex because of, you know, the different uh, privacy issues. So it, it is challenging. So with these slides, uh, we will show you a little bit, you know, what is what, what are the differences between DNSPs in terms of data availability and why we need to come up with some other techniques to calculate operating envelopes. And that's the, the second part, which will be led by Arthur, which is the calculation of operating envelopes with limited observability. And finally, uh, we will discuss one uh, aspect that uh, sometimes uh, perhaps is not clear, but actually haven't touched it, which is the widespread adoption of operating envelopes. Now, what it means there really is that so everything that uh, I have presented in block one was really related to the little low voltage transformer, you know, and the corresponding customers or the sewer network, right? Uh, in reality, if multiple neighborhoods are using operating envelopes, they affect everyone because they are going to be connected to the same electrical network. I mean, assuming they are part of the same uh, high voltage, medium voltage feeder, not the same 22 kV feeder. So therefore, those effects of people using operating envelopes, right? will affect the voltages of others. So how do we capture this simultaneously when there's a widespread adoption of operating envelopes? So it means that the calculations are not limited to the low voltage. They have to consider the high voltage. High voltage 22 kV, for instance, it's also called internationally medium voltage. So we will be discussing some of our recent results about that. And this is all part of two projects uh, funded by CSIRO and part of the Global Power System Transformation Construction, and as well, uh, IMO is part of all these projects. Uh, let's move on, uh, Arthur. So let's start with this uh, survey that we did, and these are the results. So let's start with availability of electrical models. Now, this is from 2022, and things are getting better and better. And that's great because, of course, comp companies uh, invest in having better uh, data availability and better electrical models, et cetera. But what you can see here, you know, what we have here in this spectrum is uh, ZS means uh, zone substation, all right? Um, so they have the electrical model for the zone substation. They, they stop there or they have them. And then the zone substation and the high voltage network, high voltage 22 kV, 11 kV here in Australia. And uh, then you have the zone substation plus the high voltage plus the distribution transformer. So 
the tiny distribution transformer. Some people call it the secondary substation. And uh, then we have uh, in, at the very end of the spectrum, having the sub substation, the high voltage network, the distribution transformer, and the low voltage network. Now, that is the part of the spectrum where you would like really to have all the data in terms of electrical models. Now, the reality is that as much as you can see that there are many companies there that supposedly in that part of the spectrum, uh, those low voltage network models are not validated, all right? And uh, they are not necessarily for operational purposes, but many companies are moving towards that, which is great. So the reality is that the moment that we really want to actually think of electrical models that are ready for operational purposes, we are not dead yet, all right? And that is challenging uh, to do, as I was explaining and trying to, to really make it very clear. Uh, but companies are trying to make it better. However, making it better doesn't make it, it validated. And that is quite complex because if you are not sure that a customer is in a given phase or in a associated with a given transformer, then you're going to get your calculations entirely wrong. All right. So having electrical models is important if you decide to use them and use the technique. But in the absence, of such accurate electrical models, you need to come up with something else. And this is what we'll discuss with RC. Next slide, please. So in terms of network monitoring, uh, it's very common to have, of course, uh, some substation or primary substation, same thing, uh, monitoring, right? Uh, so this goes to the SCADA. And that's fantastic. Most companies here in Australia have them, if not all, actually, as a matter of fact. But some of them go beyond. They have monitoring as well in certain parts of the corresponding high voltage feeder or like the head of the feeder, but also the transformers, the distribution transformers. So you can see here that there are companies in Australia that are already starting to embrace having more monitoring, particularly at the transformer level. And that's great because that means that with that monitoring, you can actually make more informed decisions associated with the calculation of flexible extra limits or in general operating envelopes. And there are some companies that even have much more monitoring that can actually be even pair low voltage feeder. And that's great, all right, that, that's fantastic. But in general, it's still rare, right? Distribution transformer monitors are, are, are very rare and uh, they might grow nonetheless in the future. Let's move on. Now, in terms of customer monitoring, let's separate things in terms of market and non-market data. Market data are the kilowatt hours that are normally measured every 30 minutes and they go you know, to, to the corresponding retailers, right? The non-market data, is the active and reactive power, actually the voltage magnitude, the current magnitude, the corresponding angle between the voltage and the, and the current. And these are kind of uh, pieces of information that the distribution companies can use to actually improve you know, their, their operations, their planning, et cetera. So that is what we call the non-market data. Now, uh, market data, when there's a smart meter, uh, most distribution companies have access to it, all of them actually, as a matter of fact, but non-market data, it depends. So in Victoria, for instance, when the smart meters are owned, uh, operated by the distribution companies, they have access to all that data, the market and no market. But in other parts uh, of Australia, those smart meters are actually operated by third parties, not the distribution company, which means the no market data, meaning active power, reactive power, or you know, voltage current and then dangle to then calculate the active and reactive power needs to be bought. And that, of course, creates some challenges, of course, because it means you need to justify the corresponding expense, but also, you know, integrating that data that comes from a third party, not just yourself. So uh, it is still rare to see operational use of non-market data in the low voltage, but totally doable. I think that there's, just, there's a lot of potential. Next slide. In terms of forecast, as you would expect, there's forecasts that happen uh, significantly in at the sun substation level, primary substation, and per high voltage feeder as well. All right, so this is the aggregate. You can have thousands of customers. There are some companies that are incorporating a forecast as well at the distribution transformer, particularly those that have you know uh, smart meter data, so they can aggregate per distribution transformer and then they start doing forecast as well. Uh, but uh, you can see that it is very rare. So most companies, if they do forecast they will just stop at the corresponding head of the theater of the high voltage feeder, right? And that's that's okay, that's normal, that's very common around the world, but that also means you know, that forecast is something that we are not doing and we need to prepare if we are gonna implement operating engines. Next slide. So this is a, a 
Final slide, then we uh, move to the discussions of the different operating envelope implementations because of all of this. So what we're seeing here is that many companies across Australia, you know, have uh, good levels of monitoring and electrical models, but not necessarily to the point that we're ready for operating envelope implementation. So they need to come up with some strategies where they make the most of what they have. And that's what is actually happening, right? Because there, there's a, uh, a realization that having electrical models can actually not be the best route, and then therefore uh, they need to come up with some other alternative. Alternatives that are backed by added monitoring and very good decision making in terms of you know, the engineering aspects of calculation of operating envelopes. So given that we will have this different uh, spectrum of availability of data, etc., we will have different operating envelope implementations. And this is what Arthur will be discussing in the next slide. Arthur. Yep, so that's me now. Hello, everyone. So I will guide you through the calculation of operating envelopes with limited observability. So although I will explain as well the ideal as an under explained where, where we have all the data, I will focus more on the simplified uh, approach. The idea will be more as a benchmark for the other ones. So this is first an overview of all the implementations we used here. There are four of them. I will be quick here because next I have a very step-by-step -step, uh, process explaining how to calculate them. So let's start with the idea one. I will not take long here. And I already explained you need the whole network model, impedances, topology, and phase connectivity, and also monitoring you know, all the customers and at the head of the feeder to properly calculate this. Then you can really build the model and run power flows. Um, so this one is just a benchmark for us in this case, but I will explain how to calculate this in more detail as well next. The first one, the simplified one, is the what we call asset capacity OE. This asset capacity OE only deals with thermal aspects of the low voltage network. So you need a monitoring at the distribution transformer or at the head of, head of the feeders, so you can have a um, real-time reading there. And with this, you can calculate the spare capacity of the whole network, and you can allocate this spare capacity to all the flexible customers you have in this network. Uh, here is, is, there are two ways of making this allocation. can be equally, like the same value for everyone, or you can do it proportionally, proportionally based on the DR size that the customer have. But uh, in these slides, mostly we are doing the equal allocation. So we are not going to focus on the allocations itself. Just remember it's equal in our case. Uh, Phil Luis will be talking about this in block three where he compares different, way, uh, different ways of allocating uh, these operating envelopes and what is the impact for the system and for the customers as well. So let's leave this for Phil Luis to discuss uh, in the block three of today. Um, so the asset capacity then it just solves thermal problems. And that's why we came up with all the two uh, simplified approaches. These two, the asset capacity and critical voltage and the asset capacity and delta voltage, try to calculate the voltages at a critical customer, right? That's the big difference here. So you're trying to find out what's the voltage at a critical customer. So the big difference between them is that one tries to estimate the variations of voltages at the head of the feeder during the day, uh, the ups and downs that you have during the day because of uh, changing consumption and generation. So this is the delta voltage. And the critical voltage is just having a sensitivity curve of the critical customer, so relating its active power with its own voltage. So I would say in terms of monitoring, uh, is just one more monitoring compared to the asset capacity, which is a monitoring at the critical customer. But we deal the data differently, which with each one to calculate the sensitivity curves that you see here, the critical voltage is just one sensitivity curve and the asset capacity delta voltage, we have two sensitivity curves uh, and both are trying to estimate the voltages at the critical customer. Uh, so let's go to the example. So I think that's the best way for you to understand this these operating envelopes. Uh, let's start with the idea. We have this network here with two normal customers. They are not flexible. They're just fixed there with their demands. And we have flexible customer at the end of the feeder. 
uh, we have the readings from the whole network. So we know it's 250 volts at the head of the feeder, a maximum of 15 kVA on the transformer. And this is just single phase to simplify things. So first of all, to calculate the operating envelope that we can deliver to flexible customers, we set uh, the operating envelopes to the maximum that we have. In this case, it's 10 kilowatts for the single phase. So we start with 10 kilowatts and we calculate the power flows of the network to know how are the voltages, how are the powers, and see if there is any problem. In this case here, as you can see, there are voltage problems at the end of the feeder, uh, and also there is an overutilization of the transformer. So we have to reduce this 10 kilowatts in the next step so to find the correct operating envelope. So we do another step and reduce it to nine, and we run another power flow to know what are the voltages and thermal problems. So this time, the thermal problems were solved in the transformer, but we still have problems at the end um, of the feeder because of voltage problems, right? So it means, again, we have to reduce these operating envelopes to another level, and now we reduce to eight kilowatts. And when we run the power flow, in this case, we see all the voltages are within the limits. Also, the transformer should be fine because before it was. And as soon as you get this at this point, you don't reduce the operating envelope anymore. This is actually the operating envelope that you were looking for, which is the eight kilowatts for all the customers with the equal location that we are doing here. This is the principle of the idea we running power flow and using the networks and all the monitoring data that we, we should have in the network in this case. However, as Nando mentioned before, it's difficult to have all this data available. And so almost impossible to do this in practice in the everyday for the DNSPs. That's why we came up with the different simplified approach, which I will explain now. So this is first the asset capacity OE. Just to remember, this is for thermal issues only. No voltage issues are going to be solved in this case. Uh, in here, we don't need the network models. As you can see, there is no line for networks here. You just need data from some parts of the network. So the data from the distribution transform is one thing that you need. And also an estimation from the total aggregated flexible power in the, in the flexible cosmos. So once you have this, you can do a spare capacity calculation, which is simple, just the capacity of the transformer minus the amount that is being used by the flexible customers, in this case, the seven kilowatts, which is found by subtracting the 10 kilowatts in blue here, minus the flexible customers um, that you know aggregatedly um, somehow, you should have some forecast for that actually, um, or a real time reading, uh, which would be ideal. Um, after that, you just split the spare capacity for all uh, the flexible customers you have. So you know it's eight, the spare capacity divide four and four for the other two. And you, you should be within the limits because the transformer here have now 15 kilowatts passing there, the seven plus eight from the two flexible. So you found your operating envelope for the asset capacity OE. However, in this case, remember, it will not solve any voltage problems. As you can see, we are not checking voltage problems because it's not possible. Uh, so, for the next uh, example, we are trying to calculate now the voltage at the critical customer. So let's say the critical customer is the customer at the end, right? So the, the beginning here is similar to the set capacity, it's actually the same thing. So you first do the spare capacity calculation as you did before, and you know it is eight kilowatts um, of spare capacity, and you first divide this eight kilowatts to all the flexible customers you have. Now you have four kilowatts for each one of the flexible customers, and you have to check if the critical customer, which is the last one, has voltage problems or not. And that's when the sensitivity curve comes into play, where you're gonna use these four kilowatts as input in this sensitivity curve. And this sensitivity curves will tell you what four kilowatts means in terms of voltage for that critical customer. In this case, it gave 254 volts, which is above of the limit of 353 here in Australia. So this OE cannot be used. It's creating voltage problems. Then you reduce again the four to three. And again, you use this in the sensitivity curve and see how much voltage the three kilowatts would give in this critical customer. And now it's saying it's 253 volts, 
which should be fine for the network. So you adopt the tricky loads for all the flexible customers, and this is your operating envelope limit uh, for all the flexible customers in this case. So moving on to the next one, the delta voltage OE. Uh, the beginning, I will be quick. It's the same as before. First, the thermal capacity um, that we have is split between the customers. And now we know the four again, as example here, we use two sensitivity curves to find out the voltage in the critical customer. The first sensitivity curve tries to relate the total power in the transformer with its voltage. And the second one relates the total power in the transformer with the delta voltage to, from the transformer to the critical customer. So when you sum these two, the voltage at the transformer that the sensitivity curve gave to you, plus the delta voltage that you found out with the second sensitivity curve, you should discover or estimate the voltage at the critical customer, right? In this case, it's above the limits. So again, you just do a reduction in the OE to three, and you use these two sensitivity curves again to calculate the new voltage. And this time you solved the voltage problems and it should be within the limits. And as you can see, there is no thermal problems or voltage problems. You accept the three kilowatts as the operating envelope for this network. So this is the basics of calculating these operating envelopes. Um, and I hope it was well explained. If not, you can make questions at the end and I can go back to this. Uh, so let's jump to a case study now where I'm gonna present how this should work and how they should perform. So I saw some questions in the previous block asking for numbers like um, how many voltage, the, how, how what's the percentage of voltage that passed the limits? I think that was one of the questions in the case. Now we're gonna show this type of uh, numbers so you can have this information that you were looking for. So in this case study here, we are considering this low voltage network here, which has three feeders, three low voltage feeders connected to the same low voltage transformer. And of course, this is connected to a higher voltage uh, network. So we can have the voltage uh, at the head of the feeder making the reading from this connection that we have here. So we, we can do all these tests with IDEO, um, as benchmark and the asset capacity OE, the critical voltage, the delta voltage, and compare all of them. So in this case, we are considering volt watt, volt var functions for the fixed cosmos, only fixed cosmos, you know, the legacy fixed cosmos that um, that will be there today, for example, we are considering this. 30% of the cosmos are already there and they are not going to use operating envelopes. So we call them fixed cosmos. Sometimes it's called legacy fixed cosmos as um, NH Queensland will show tomorrow with Alex, they call a legacy because these guys are not going to move to OEs, for example. They, they are just in the normal five kilowatts exports that they had before. And that's what we are going to consider here. And then we add on top of this 30% in four scenarios, the flexible customers. So these are the customers that are going to use operating envelopes and they have a maximum export of 10 kilowatts. And of course, we will calculate, it can be 10 or less. It depends on the calculation, right? So that's how it goes. And we are going to compare uh, all of those. Uh, in the case of the flexible customer, we don't consider the volt 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 var functions to be activated because we are using operating envelopes that should solve the problem. Um, so yeah, keep that in mind because this may affect the results in the end. I will comment on that. Uh, so just for the assessment considerations here, uh, you're going to see many tables with many numbers. So maybe you're going to get lost. So we use some color coding to help you out and what you think uh, from the table. So if it is green, all the voltage limits are within the limits and all the asset capacities are also below 100% utilization. If it is yellow, voltage can be a little bit above the limits some in some of the net of the customers but it will be below the 258 volts, which could trip the PV inverter. So we consider this case as acceptable. And of course, voltage compliance is being assessed here as well. And if the network is between 95 and 100%, as the standards say that should be, we say it's also acceptable. 
And acetylization, we know transformers can go a bit beyond the limits, sometimes above 100%. So up to 110%, we also call it acceptable. It's not ideal, but we can accept some passing the limits. But if you go way beyond the limits where you're going to trip PV system, for example, when you go beyond 258 volts, or if you have voltage compliance below 95%, or if a set of utilizations are above 110%, we just say it's red, it's not acceptable, and we cannot consider that as a good solution for the network. So let's go into the fixed exports, which I did not explain yet, but Nando mentioned it uh, very well explained before. Those fixed exports is the option that DNSPs would give to new flexible customers if they don't want to adopt operating loops. So they will tell the customer if they are installing a new PV, they are going to give them an option. Oh, you choose a fixed export of 1.5 kilowatts, or you choose to follow the operating envelopes that we're gonna calculate. And they're gonna have to check and decide, right? So here is showing the fixed exports and what is the impact of using it instead of operating envelopes? In this case, it, we are using 1.5 kilowatts fixed export, which is being used by DNSPs in Australia, as you're going to see tomorrow with uh, SAP and, and Energy Queensland. And, and we do that for all the fixed, flexible customers as if they were using fixed exports. So what you see in the first column here is for all scenarios, all of them use 1.5 exports all the time of the day. And as you can see, in comparison to the one in the right, which is the ideal, it is, corte it is very small, which means you are reducing a lot the amount of exports that the household would do all the time. You could do it much better with operating envelopes. That's what it's showing you. So let's go for some numbers then, where we assess the technical uh, problems and the energy uh, that each one will release to the network. So first, uh, at the beginning, there is the maximum voltage at Cosmos. We assess them, the low voltage network compliance. We also assess them. And of course, for fixed, it should be fine. It's a very small number for this network, 1.5. There's no problem at all. And the ideal is ideal. You calculated everything uh, with perfect data. So there shouldn't be any problems. As you can see, it's all green. There's no problem. The big difference here is in the um, aggregated exports that each one can do. If you compare, for example, let's say a scenario one where 5% of flexible costs is there. If you compare the energy that you can, you are injecting the network for the fixed export is 7.5 at 8 a.m. If you go to the ideal week, you could be doing 50 if it were available, of course. So it is, it's much bigger uh, than the ideal in compared to the fixed exports. And that's the main message. So always really bring benefits in this case. So let's move then to the asset capacity OE. Uh, in this one, just for you to remember, we are not solving voltage problems. It's just thermal problems. Uh, as you can see here on the first column on the left, all the scenarios, it gives almost all the time the maximum capacity for all the customers we have there, flexible customers. And only scenario four, the transformer starts having limitations because it's over is overloading. So you reduce these powers. If you compare with the IDOE, you can see that the asset capacity OE is overestimating the operating envelopes, which should suggest that you're going to have some problems there, right? It's over relaxed. And that's what you're going to see confirmed in these numbers here. So when you have the asset capacity, you have two situations, or you are in the okay region, or you are in the not acceptable region. So for the short penetration or small penetration of flexible costumes, you are in the okay region. Yes, some voltages are going beyond the limits, but since there are volt far, volt watt functions in the fixed costumes, you know, the legacy ones I was talking about, they help to bring the voltage down and keep them there. So you can still use this asset capacity OE for short, so for a small penetration of flexible customers. And maybe even through, you know, when you start going to a medium penetration, but when you go to higher penetration, not it's not possible to be used anymore. But remember, I was telling you, we did not consider volt watt, volt watt curves in the 
TV inverters of flexible customers. So if they were considered these these reds that you see on the higher penetration of flexible cosmos could be reduced. Maybe it could go to the acceptable range or maybe not. It will really depends on the situation. So that's the main message here. Compared to the idea, idea is always good. Um, but the big difference here is in the implementation. The asset capacity implementation is not complex at all. It's just a single point monitoring at the distribution transformer, which should not cost too much for the DNSP. In comparison to the IDEO, you need full monitoring and full electrical commandos, and it should be very costly and very difficult to implement for the DNSP. Um, yep, so let's move on to the next one, the asset capacity in delta voltage OE because I'm not showing the critical voltage, they have very similar uh, results, but this one, since it tries to capture the voltage variation at the head of the feeder, uh, I decided to present this one only, right? Because of time as well. So if you compare here, the scenario four, you can really see that it tries to follow the voltage variation on the day. It goes up and down, you know, all this um, up and downs it have, it's really trying to follow. Uh, the network. It's very close actually to the idea. However, it overestimates a little bit as well the um, operating envelopes, which means you're going to have some problems in the networks. And that's what uh, we are going to see here as well. So although it tries to solve voltage problems, it does not solve all voltage problems. It reduces problems, but it doesn't solve them. Because uh, this is a simple estimation. I have to remember that. You just have one reading at a critical customer and you are making very simple sensitivity curves to calculate these voltages. Of course, it can always be improved, but here we are we're trying to be as simple as possible. It's like you get the data, you throw it in, in Python, and you get the sensitivity curve, and you use it here. So it's, it should be easy to do this one, but of course, it will put compromise in the effectiveness of the voltage solution as well. So here, First thing you see is for short, medium term, yeah, you can still use this um, operating envelope calculation. Well, you can see that there is a big difference of voltage between stage uh, scenario three and four and in the maximum voltage. In scenario three, which has less flexible cosmos, it goes up to 261. But in scenario four, which has more flexible cosmos, it stays in 256. And also, the voltage compliance is better in scenario four rather than in three, which, which could be intriguing. And you could ask yourself, why is this happening? Right? But this is only happening because the critical cosmos that we chose here, which was always the last cosmos in our case, it is not the critical cosmos for scenario three. Uh, we double checked later, and it was another cosmos, the critical cosmos. This means that the selection of critical cosmos is very important for this. Um, operating envelope to work well. If you choose it, the incorrect one, you're going to see much worse voltage problems. If you choose the correct critical customer, you can improve a lot the voltage problems, right? So again, applies here what I said before. If we consider volt to work, volt var functions on the flexible customers, these voltages could be uh, um, decreased even more. Uh, we are not considering this here. Yep, and in terms of implementation, uh, complexity, it's a bit more complex only if compared to the asset capacity. You just need an extra monitoring in the critical customer. It shouldn't be that expensive for the DNSPs as well, but the idea, of course, it is. Uh, and that's the great benefits of the simplified versions, uh, The how complex it is to implement and how costly it would be. It's much less than the idea. Right. Um, so here is just a comparison of all of them. Here I include the critical voltage just for you to have as a comparison. Uh, the main takeaway from here is that you can manage um, the network with small or medium penetration for the simplified approaches. But when you go to the higher ones, you need a more advanced approach, such as the IDOE, for example. And another message is that the fixed exports, it really prevents the net or the customer to export a lot of energy and you don't use the network properly because it's a too small valve, right? So the OE brings big benefits there 
where you release a lot of energy uh, to the network. And the third message is simplified OIS is much less complex to implement and less costly as well. Um, and for the short term, this tells you, uh, this brings to my next slide. So for the short term and medium term, it tells you that we don't really need the full of voltage network models and all 100% monitoring to do some management, good management of the network. The NSPs can start using the simplified approach for now because we have just a few flexible customers. And of course, they will have time then to develop, uh, to prepare for the more advanced um, techniques. For example, the IDOE. All the advanced technique that could be used is only based on data and AI, and it's called model-free operating rules uh, that Vincenzo will be talking about uh, tomorrow. And, but the big question here is, all of this was done, as Nando said, for one single low voltage network. How would it work? And we call it a per neighborhood uh, calculation, right? When you do an isolated low voltage network. When we do this, when everyone do this and start adopt this everywhere, widely in the network by all the customers, what would be the impact on that assessment? Would this still work or not? That's the question we want to answer in the next part, which is the widespread adoption of operating envelopes. So, just to recap, right now the NSPs started everything calculating operating envelopes for each low voltage network independently. So we call it per neighborhood. So they calculate there if they have three low voltage networks, as you can see here, they calculate operating envelopes for one separately, the second separately, the third separately. But in reality, if these networks are connected to the same high voltage feeder as they are in the picture in the bottom, they will actually interact with each other. Their power flows will interact. And this will bring challenges, especially regarding voltage challenges, because when you allow one of the networks to export a lot of power, it will bring voltage up to many different low voltage networks around them. So all the neighbors will be affected. So if you think many of the net these networks are exporting back to the network, and you're starting to rise the whole high voltage network all together, you get wrong results actually when you do the per neighborhood calculation because you are not considering this interaction between these low voltage networks. So I'll, I'll give an example so it can be a bit more clear. So let's assume here that we are doing a per neighborhood calculation, right? So we have these four neighborhoods there separately as if they didn't they, they weren't connect to the high voltage so let's we just use one of these techniques to calculate the operating envelopes and let's say that the operating envelopes that they have they are those ones in red here and we give it to them and they are going to start to implement um, them right and they use this now when they use these operating envelopes and they are connected to the high voltage network, as I said, they will interact with each other. What would happen, for example, if this network here in the end, uh, top uh, right, if they use all of the houses, use the five kilowatts that we gave to them, it will rise the voltages. It may rise the voltage in, on its own network to 252, one voltage more. And it will impact as well all the other voltages in the other neighbors to one voltage more, for example, in each one of them. This means if this happened, what you calculated before considering the previous voltage is not valid anymore. You would need another operating envelope for these networks because its neighbors just decide to use the full uh, amount they, they were giving to them. So this creates an incorrect calculation of operating envelopes when you are using the per neighborhood calculation. So that's why we need to calculate this in a different way, which we call the integrated high voltage, low voltage. So you consider all these interactions and you don't have this sort of problems here. Um, so that, that's what I'm gonna show here. So there was just a concept. And this is the case study from one of the projects that we have with CSIO, uh, that one that Nando said it was in 2023, last year. Um, and here we did the per neighborhood calculation um, with the same settings as before. So fixed customers, they have volt-watt-volt-watt functions. 
Uh, now we are considering uh, the per neighborhood calculation. So although these high voltages here, we are not considering it for the calculations, just the small ones, separated ones you see there. And let's see how it goes if we calculate per neighborhood, but assess them in an integrated way, right? So we have also fixed customers with PV, five kilowatts export limits. Those are the legacy customers that I was telling you before. They stay with the five kilowatts PV all the time. And the flexible customers that are coming are always receiving uh, a maximum of 10, but we then we calculate they could be below 10, but it will not never pass 10 because that's the limit for single phase in our considerations. And now we will only use the idea we just show this concept here. Okay, moving on to the results. Uh, first of all, let's assess the line utilizations. As you can see in all scenarios, everything is green. So it's no problem with line utilization, which, which is great. Let's go then for the transform utilization. And then you start seeing some impacts of not considering these interactions between the low voltage networks. For example, in the smaller penetrations, you don't have these problems. But when you go to the higher penetrations, 15%, 25%, or even 40%, you start seeing small over thermal limits, passing the thermal limits of the transformer some parts of the day here and there. It's not that much. It's just 2%, 1, 2, just because of the not consideration of these interactions. It's still fine, acceptable. As we said before, if it is below 110, this is still fine. But we starting seeing these problems. But the biggest problem is are on the voltages. As you can see on the simulations, even for a small penetration of flexible cost, let's say 15%, you have a lot of customers with over voltage problems and not one is more over voltage problems. You have above 258 volts, which is way beyond the limits and it will trip their PV systems, which is not good for anyone, not even, not for the cost, not for the NSPs. So in this case, just because we did not consider this interaction between the low voltage networks, you can see that these voltage problems are not solved properly. And that's why we, we can say that the per neighborhood calculation does not work well when we join all of these networks in the same high voltage uh, network, which is going to happen in the future, right? Once you increase the number of flexible customers, you're going to have more and more people in the area using operating envelopes. So this will start to happen if the per neighborhood is used. Uh, then, which brings to our next case, which is actually wrong here on the top, it should be integrated OE calculation. Uh, now, this is the integrated OE calculation. We are considering this network being simulated all at once. And so considering both high voltage and low voltage to calculate operating envelopes, right? And uh, the same considerations for PV Cosmos, fixed Cosmos, uh, flexible Cosmos are the same as before. So nothing changed. The only thing that changed is the calculation. Here, the calculation is integrated high voltage, low voltage network. And this should solve the interaction problems that we had before. Now we consider those interactions. So all the OEs are going to be smaller to compensate that. So, and that's exactly what I'm showing here for the, uh, when we compare both per neighborhood and integrated. And you can see the per neighborhoods in the left in each one of these big squares and the integrated on the right. So there is all the scenarios here. And in all of them, you can see that the OE calculated uh, is smaller for the integrated high voltage, low voltage. And this is because we are considering those interactions that I told you in the per neighborhood, they are not considered. And this is very important because this will avoid the problems we had before that I just showed you. Um, so yeah, the per neighborhood just overestimate OEs. Um, so let's show how this solves the problem then. All the transform utilization, they don't have any problems anymore. Not even the one, two percent, they are all within the limits, which is great. When you go to the line utilization now, all within the limits as well, which is also great. When you go to the voltage where we had very big problems there, you basically see almost no problems. In scenario one and four, you have no problem at all. In scenario two and three, you have some customs going a little bit beyond the limits, but they don't achieve the 258, so it's still acceptable. And let me tell you why these guys are going up 
above the limits, even for the ideal, it's just because those cosmos are in a low voltage network where there's no flexible cosmos there. So the DNSP cannot calculate any operating envelope for that network, right? So they cannot solve any problems with operating envelopes. Something else has to be used, not operating envelopes, simply because there is no uh, cosmos there. But of course, as you can see here, in comparison to the previous case, we don't have voltage problems at all. You can really say that. So we really are capturing all the interactions between the low voltage networks in this case. So let's move to the tables then, comparing the numbers, the actual numbers here. We put here the fixed exports, the ideal we per neighborhood, and the integrated ideal for we. So the integrated is the one that should work properly. The per neighborhood is the one that I told you, since you're not considering interactions, it will not work well. And the fixed export is mostly here to show in the energy later that it does not really help with energy release, right? So, of course, fixed exports, technically speaking, it's solving all the problems as we were expecting from the previous cases as well. Uh, I'm not spending time here. So, I like spending time on comparing the per neighborhood with the integrated. As you can see, the per neighborhood had problems all over the place for higher penetrations of, um, of flexible cosmos. So, only for 5% of flexible cosmos, you could say it's acceptable because you still, you have a voltage compliance here down on the last part of the table, it is still 98%. So you could accept that as okay. But the rest of the cases uh, with higher penetrations, now nah, you wouldn't be okay. The network ha would have way too many uh, voltage problems. So the integrated high voltage OE calculation basically solves almost all the problems, but the problems in low voltage networks where we don't have flexible cosmos, which is the case where you see in yellow here, but it's impossible to be solved with operating envelopes, as I said before. Uh, let's move on to the thermal problems now. The thermal problems, you can see uh, the fixed exports, there's no problem. The idea we per neighborhood, yeah, it solved well the problems. So the maximum thermal problems you had in the utilization of transforms was 103%, which is still fine. And just 5% of these transformers, all of them had this problem. So from 79, three, four had this over voltage for a few moments of the day, which would be just fine. Uh, the idea we integrated, it solves all the problems perfectly, right? So the conclusions for thermal problems, yes, the integrated and per neighborhood would work fine. Now let's move to the energy release. This part I would like to bring your attention to the fixed exports consideration. First of all, we consider 1.5 kilowatts for the, um, as a comparison for all the fixed cosmos. And this is considering also the PV capacity that they have, which is maximum of five kilowatts for all of them, right? In this case, you can see easily here that you can release, for example, 52%, around 52% of energy if compared to the fixed exports with five kilowatts PV system in all uh, the flexible cosmos, which is a really good uh, release of energy already. However, if you think of the today's average of, of the size of PV system we have, which is nine that Nando just told, so it's much bigger than five, right? So if you increase those PV systems, you're going to actually get much more released energy if you compare with 1.5 kilowatts. So we've seen some of our simulations that are going to release uh, on the project soon, where that we can have a, more than 100% easily of released energy for um, for the year. In this case, it's just a date that I'm sure. Um, but yeah, it would be, the proportion is the same for a year or day. Um, anything to add here, Nanda? Well, I mean, I think it's just to reflect, I mean, of course, we're not presenting all the results of this particular project, that would be a, a, another report. But similar to what I was starting with this little slide uh, an hour ago, where I was showing you know, for one customer that there was much more energy being released compared to a fixed export that is very conservative, the 1.5 kilowatt that is very likely to be used by distribution companies as the alternative to operating envelopes, operating envelopes will bring much more to the table. Now, important to reflect on the fact that with fixed exports of 1.5, uh, we don't have problems in the networks. So, 
it, it might seem conservative, but it is solving the, the challenge that the distribution companies had, which is you know, excessive voltage or you know, even several problems. And that means you know, no further reinforcements, network augmentation is needed. The problem, however, is that, of course, we are not extracting as much PV generation as we could. And that is the power of the operating envelopes. Now, in terms of where it is uh, per neighborhood or integrated, you know, of course, as Arthur is mentioning, really, we, we need to, to consider aspects to some extent uh, of, of the high voltage part so we can really calculate things in a little bit better way. And we will release results of what happens with the other uh, simplified operating envelopes as well. But when it comes in terms of energies, I just, I just find it fascinating, you know, how much more can be done. And this is uh, right now just for a day, of course, we will do this, you know, for different seasons as well. So it will be interesting results. Back to you, Arthur. Yep. So uh, as a uh, key remarks for this uh, part is that the integrated um, high voltage, low voltage OE calculation works well for multiple neighborhoods and when they interact because we are yeah, really properly catering for all the interaction we have there. Uh, but we also have to conclude that, that for the short term, all the areas with low penetration of DERs, the pain of the OE calculation would be fine. You are still within you know, the voltage compliance. Yeah, you have some customers above, but they are mostly not being tripped and the voltage compliance are still fine. Then when you go to the medium term or long term, you really need the integrated high voltage, uh, low voltage OE calculation. Uh, then you could use the simplified techniques. I didn't show them here, but this is from the report that's coming. You could use some of them for this medium term. But again, for the long term, as in the previous case, you need some advanced techniques which could be, for example, the idea in this case, and it should be done integrated as well. You also have other techniques that are advanced based only on data, for example, which Vincenzo is going to show uh, tomorrow, which is based on, on data. So it's called model free. So it also very good uh, and could be used when you have data, a lot of data actually from the whole network. Uh, but ultimately um, an OE implementation should fit each available infrastructure and data. As Nando was saying, different DNSPs will have different realities, different data. So they should choose whatever is best for them for the moment. And they can still still have time to prepare for the future where they need to have some more advanced techniques. And that's it. So thank you uh, for everyone. Uh, thank you, Cesar and Global GPST and AIMO for the support on the projects. Thank you very much, Arthur. So we have a few minutes to go through the questions. Uh, so the question for this part starts at 10, 10 a.m., of course. Uh, so let me go through them quickly. Uh, Ryan, you're asking about our involvement in the EMC. Well, to be honest, I wasn't involved, but uh, that might be a question to answer, to, 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 to ask uh, Pierre-Louis, because I believe he has been involved with some private EMC, but not necessarily what you're mentioning here. Um, then there's uh, slide six, the interval changes in power quality. Well, again, I, I'm not familiar about that uh, at all. Uh, there's anonymous uh, attendee. What do you mean by refer to critical customer? So the, at, the start, at the start of the feeder is not critical. The, the critical will always be at the end of the feeder, electronically speaking. So the house at the very end of the street. Now, the reality is that it's not just impedance what defines a critical customer. It can be the actual location with respect to other customers as in, I don't know, the other customers are uh, heavy users of photovoltaics or they're not at home any, any most of the time. Okay? So it's like they, they don't exist. So whatever it is, uh, that critical customer can be identified by using the voltage profiles of historical data. Uh, so that would be the best way of, of identifying and comparing it to other customers. But if you don't have a lot of data, how do you make it? Well, I mean, you just go for the closest, which is that, that, that one farthest from the transformer. All right, so that would be one way. So it depends on what data you have available. Any Anything to add there, Arthur? Uh, he was asking if it's at the start of the, the feeder. No, it's at the end of the feeder, just to make sure. Yeah, yeah, so, the so, critical so, so, yeah critically, well, because it's impedance, that, that's correct. Um, yeah, moving on to the other questions there. Uh, there's, uh, uh, oh, the, the, uh, I'm not the engineer, so we'll look at the quizzes. Yes, the quizzes won't have calculations, but they still, uh, it requires you know attending the different lectures because it's content from the lectures. Uh, Richard is asking, uh, would you cover moments of cloud? Uh, well, I mean, if if you look at our our simulations, do do cover do do capture the realistic PV generation and demand uh, because we we have used anonymized 
data from actual customers. So yes, cloud coverage, uh, changes in where uh, human conditions, et cetera, are being captured in our simulations. But of course, this is this is past data and, and things change as well. But now in the context of forecast, uh, what well, we have in the forecast, I just presented what, what was, was considered a, in the case of break age, and there were challenges, as I was mentioning. And in the case of this part that uh, Arthur was presenting, forecasts are not considered. This is all perfect forecast, which means everything that you're seeing as potential uh, challenges uh, or errors you know, in, in the different uh, calculations can be exacerbated by uh, errors in forecast, which is very important to consider. Um, moving on, Hyperly, we will be starting a few minutes. Uh, so get ready there with your slides and things. Um, then uh, any other, uh, okay, 1024, when you say critical customers is farthest from the transformer. Uh, all right, I already mentioned this already in terms of the impedance, but not necessarily is the only criteria because there's some balances in this. Uh, Claire is asking, I see slides anymore. This is just me. I don't know what happened, but the slides were working according to me. <laughs> Hopefully they are all back. Uh, Tim is asking, uh, Lighthouse questions, look out, we consider company price signals and appropriate models. No, 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 no. This is all technical about operating envelopes and what can be calculated in known time. Uh, nothing related to prices. Uh, Felicity, uh, which actually prices can be incorporated in the calculation, by the way, uh, Tim, but no, no, nothing what we're discussing right now because it creates another level of complexity as well. Uh, Felicity is a bit lost. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, I was assuming that the most critical customer was the one farther to uh, the transformer. Yeah, that's, 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 uh, that is correct, but it's not always the case. This is our three phase networks. And depending on that location, the unbalances that can happen can actually create that not the electrical distance is the only criteria. It can be very, very close, but perhaps not the last customer, electrically speaking, relative to the transformer, but perhaps the, the one before that one or two ones before. So it's generally speaking, it's, it's the far different transformer is not just that, uh, uh, and that all depends on the data you have, and you can actually check this, you know, with the data uh, from from the smart meters or any monitoring that you can actually place. Karen is asking. Uh, you mentioned the use of AI. Uh, well, I mean, uh, you you will see a little bit of uh, the potential of uh, AI uh, tomorrow with a presentation of Vinny. So I'm not going to go uh, deeper on that. You must ask you, uh, Arthur. You're obviously trying to demonstrate problems, but it seems that you're assuming nothing close to the 230. Uh, what is the standard? Uh, well, um, there, there are there are challenges, uh, particularly with the. Uh, uh, can you go to one of the tables uh, there, Arthur, uh, that you show? Not with the neighborhood and integrated, but the other ones that simplify things. So this 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 okay. table really shows there are many many challenges here. It's not just voltages going beyond the uh, two hundred fifty three, which is the upper limit. So that's that's. Uh, the, the one, and but also in cases that well, goes to really much, much higher than 253 that can even trip uh, the corresponding PV inverters. And also, of course, the corresponding acid utilization. So there, there, are, there are many challenges there the moment yeah. that you simplify the corresponding calculations. Then. Can I complement uh, on that? Because sure. he's asking if there is nothing close to 230 volts. We are not showing the table anything that is really within the limits. We are trying to show what is, you know, above or in the limits. So, yes, there are lots of customers that, you know, in the lower voltage, they are within the limits. Within the limits. But yeah. here we are trying to show the limits, like who is really, you know, creating the problems. Uh, all of these, the, these are technical calculations that are about finding where everything is fine. And when everything is fine, it's that you need to calculate for all the customers. If an, a few are compromised, then that is something that uh, needs to be raised. And that's what we're trying to achieve here. Just for the sake of time, uh, uh, unfortunately, we won't be able to go through all the other questions because I really want to give all the corresponding time. So I'm going to stop here the, the, the recording.